Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to CDE Virtual, our first event in 2022. I'm going to hand over to Mike Teki, CEO of Sariti Business, Sariti Resources, University of Johannesburg Chair, Council Chair, and CDE Board Member to introduce our discussion. Mike, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you. And thanks for this opportunity to introduce tonight's uh, conversation. We know that CDE at 25 webinars have been taking place. And in 2022, this is the first one, which is going to be called from now on CDE Conversations. Why? CDE is no more 25. It's beyond that. It's true, I've been serving as a board member of CDE from the 1st of August, 2016. And this is one of those boards and where I don't think I've contributed a lot. And I, want, I, I need to make time and ensure that I make my contribution to this organization now. But what is important, it's the role that CDE plays in this country. We are a country that's facing a deepening uh, crisis. The crisis that we face comes from multiple fronts. It's social, it's commercial, it's technology quite a number of areas that this country needs to deal with. And I believe this is a country with great resources, great people, and we can have a great future. And I've seen the contribution, the positive contribution that CDE has played positively in influencing the policy environment in South Africa. And I believe conversations like this, inviting people like Sir Michael Ababa to come and talk to us, a topic like the one you've chosen as CDE, delivery from talk to action. It's critical at this juncture. We are at a state where this country doesn't need talking. This country doesn't need workshops. This country doesn't need sessions and conferences. It is time that we act. Today, I participated in a conversation about youth unemployment. And I realized that it's one of those deep crises that we face as a country. And without any waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, I believe handing over back to and to introduce Sir Michael Baba, I just want to leave you with, 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 with the message that says, if you are capable as a South African resources in terms of time, not only money, but in terms of time, in terms of capacity, in terms of institutional knowledge, please make sure that you rise up and let's make sure that Africa, South Africa emerges as that powerful country in this continent. And I'm looking forward to this conversation tonight and, and back to you. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a very great privilege to welcome Sir Michael Barber back to South Africa, even if only virtually. Uh, we've known him a long time. He's been a friend of CDEs. We had hoped to bring him to South Africa in March 2020. But fate intervened and we had to cancel his week in Johannesburg and Pretoria. So I'm really pleased we can do this this evening. Michael is one of the world's experts on how to manage reform, the do's and don'ts for public sector reformers. He focuses on how to turn policy change into actually making things happen in governments, mainly in governments how to turn wor words and promises into results. In 2001, he founded the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit in, at number 10 Downing Street, which he ran for about five years. Since then, he has worked with governments across the globe in both rich and poorer countries. From Canada to Peru to Pakistan, he has worked with prime ministers and presidents with heads of large provinces or states and with executive mayors to help them deliver. Michael, I'm gonna jump right in. Please do. A lot of our, a lot of our audience tonight are from the non-government sector, the private sector or NGOs. So the first question is really, what is the difference between getting results in the private sector and getting results in public sector governments? Well, there's, the first thing to say is there's quite a lot of similarities, So, but you've not asked about that. So I'm, I'll talk about the differences. The diff I think one of the differences is that um, 
governments are under enormous pressure, partly from a whole series of events that at any given moment, any government in the world is facing and has to respond to, and people expect them to respond to whatever the, whatever the world throws at them. Um, so that there are pressures, m many more random pressures on a government than on a business. Of course, there are those things on a, on a business and the, and the NGO sector as well. But the but governments more. The media, the modern media is a huge pressure on politicians of all parties and backgrounds, uh, very demanding both in time and uh, thinking and emotionally, actually. So those, those two things are quite different, I think. Um, and then... Um, there's the whole political process of having made some commitments that are much generally much more public than the average NGO or, or, or government or, or business and the expectations are therefore raised. And then in this particular era that we're living in, and here I'm talking about governments all over the world, not particularly in, in Africa, there's a, there's a, a, you can see a loss of trust in government as a concept all around the world. And that that creates a whole new pressure. Um, and trust in a particular government is one thing, and in a, in a democracy, if you lose trust in one government, you can elect the, a, a different one next time. But, in, um, but if you lose trust in government institutions, in democracy, in parliaments, in politicians in general, it, then it's a very big uphill struggle then to turn that round. So there's lots of pressures on government and politics all over the world right now. And one thing, which is what I help governments with, that will help turn that around as if governments make commitments and then actually deliver them in a way that people see and feel the difference. They actually say, they hear the, the promise and then they see within a reasonable time, the outcome. That's not the only, uh, trusting government is much more complicated than that, but that's one thing you can do uh, uh, that I can help governments with to, to try to turn that trust deficit around and build it in something more positive. So just putting a, private sector CEO in charge of, for example, South Africa's police force is, is a much more complicated thing, transition, than it might appear. Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know about that particular case, but I have seen business people brought in and out of government in Britain and in, in Canada and elsewhere, and some of them manage well and some of them really struggle. Um, and some of them become... They, they kind of turn on government and politics and civil servants as they're, they're all absolutely useless. And I can see why that happens, but that doesn't, that, that actually doesn't help build a constructive relationship. And then, um, and some of them succeed. And the ones that succeed, learn their way in, try to understand the government where it is, try to build some relationships. Don't go around preaching about the private sector's good and the public sector's bad. They say, and, and actually, if we all the evidence around the world shows you there are great public sector organizations and there are great private sector organizations and there are bad ones of both, and the common characteristics are there. But the government is is generally more challenging. And last thing I'll say is you can't, if you're a government, if you've got some failing bit of your organization, you can't say, well, we'll just stop doing children's health. You still have to do it. So whereas a, a, a company can say, right, let's cut our losses and get out of that part of the business. Mm -hmm. Big difference. So what are delivery units exactly? And what is your advice to presidents and prime ministers who want to set them up? How yes. should we think about this? Yes, well, the, I, I, the first thing to say is don't start with building the unit. Start with what you want to do. What is the change you want to make? What are, the, what are the what are your priorities? Obviously, governments have to run all these everything uh, in the way that I've just been describing. But if you're a, a newly elected government, or indeed a government partway through a term, and you 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 need a reset, what is it you want to get done? What are the what are your ambitions? Um, how would you know if you were on track to, uh, to to achieving them? And then, so once you've defined your task, then think. How do I get the government machine to deliver these tasks, given all the pressures of the media and the crises and events? And for that, you need a system of delivery. And if you're a president or a minister uh, or a prime minister um, or, or a premier in, in, in one of the South African provinces, you've got at any given moment, you've got so many things to do, but you need one part of your organization that is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, focused on delivering those priorities that you've identified so it, the original delivery unit that I set up for Tony Blair started in 2001 uh, within a few months we had September the 11th uh, 2001 uh, uh, and all the consequences that flowed in Afghanistan and Iraq from that 
So, and, and, and that's not, um, I haven't even mentioned the, the European Union. So Tony Blair's got all those things he has to do, them. that's the job of the prime minister. But what he knows is that delivery for the British people is the priorities he's agreed with me and the cabinet in health, education, reducing crime, and making the transport system work better. So, we, so my promise to him is whatever happens to you, whatever happens in the world, I'm just doing those things. You can't distract me. My, my slogan with him was delivery never sleeps. We're just doing this. Nobody will distract us. I was there on September the 11th, 2001. And there he is surrounded by dozens of people offering advice from everybody from transport people to police people, to spies, to international people, to foreign relations people, everybody, finance people, treasury. And my first instinct is to go and help because this is a crisis. But actually I realized there and then that no, he's got all the help he needs and maybe more. He needs me just to keep the show on the road. And that is very, he, when I left four years later, he said, that is the most important thing you did. I knew whatever I was doing, there was one bit of the government just focused on delivering the priorities. And that's what a delivery unit that is designed well does. But I've seen government set up a thing called a delivery unit and it does absolutely nothing. So you can have bad delivery units and good ones. The key thing is to identify your priorities and then establish a function that is totally focused on that. Mm. What meant, just a, um, it's a long answer to an important question for two hours a week uh, that, that's the amount of time I needed from Tony Blair for two hours a week he got his domestic policies delivered that's a really good deal um, uh, so and you know last year I set up a delivery unit for Boris Johnson he's probably been following in the media he's been through a few crises recently he's got another one now but the delivery unit is still working and for mm. an hour or two a week he's keeping it, the media doesn't write about it, but behind the scenes, that is focused and delivering the agenda that he set a year ago. So the things- prime minister has to meet with the delivery unit on a regular basis to make sure they're on track. Yeah, yeah, more, more with the ministers responsible. So oh. the prime minister has to meet. So, so if you've got a health, let's, let's say you, you agree a health, uh, some aspect of health is a priority. The prime minister needs to meet with the health minister, say every couple of months to check progress. The delivery unit will facilitate that conversation. It'll brief the prime minister. It'll make sure that the Department of Health uh, understands what the conversation is going to be about. It'll present the data. It'll make sure the data is agreed. So when the minister and the prime minister meet, they don't argue about whether the data is true. They discuss how to solve the problems shown in the data. So the delivery unit is, is behind the scenes facilitating an honest, focused, practical conversation that isn't about who's to blame. It's about how do we solve this problem? Mm. Hmm. Great. I'm going to come back to some of those broader issues, but let's zoom into education, an area where you've spent a considerable amount of time. Now, many people tell me that fixing basic schooling so that the majority of people get a decent education will take a generation. I think you disagree. How can you start and deliver results in a massive system like education within I think three to six years how, yes. how do you do this well look I mean too often when people say something will take a generation what they actually mean is it'll take a generation so we don't need to start yet and that that is a terrible mistake so you can always start and you can always get visible change within two or three years um the job of improving the education system is never finished because the world changes what we want children to grow up and be able to do will change with it so you can con you can always improve but you can get started and you can get visible change in two to three years and the, the crucial thing that is missing in the vast majority of education reforms around the world is no education reform changes the performance of children unless it changes what teachers do all day and if you don't change what teachers do all day, the rest of it is just shifting around uh, bits of the system. But you have, to, you have to enable teachers to teach better. That's not to say they're teaching badly. So some of them are teaching brilliantly now, but they can always get better. And unless you, but unless you change how the teacher interacts with a child, let's say you want them to learn to read, teachers need to get better all the time at teaching, reading and writing and all of those things. So your reform has to get inside the classroom. If it doesn't get inside the classroom, you're mainly just dealing with window dressing. Hmm. So how important in changing what teachers do all day, how important is data or evidence and accountability? How do you think about those two issues? 
they are, but they're both very important. The, the, basically what you, and I'm not talking here just about teachers, but to change a large group of people, to change what they do all day, whether it's teachers or doctors or um, people in a business for that matter, that you need two things, simul- they need to experience two things simultaneously. First of all, they need to feel some pressure to make the change, some reason why they should change. We're all, as human beings, very attached to the status quo and we need a bit of a, uh, an incentive or a shove to move from what we're doing now to something different. It's difficult and it's time consuming. And you always think that the status quo is okay, even if it's a bit mediocre and you always fear the change. So you need a, you need a kind of shove and accountability will help with that. And data that shows that you could be better will also help with that. So that's how that, so there are pressure on somebody to change, but at the same time, you need to enable the, the, the person you're trying to change to do differently what they're what they're doing so they need the support to change so I, I always say to anybody make sure the level of the teacher or the doctor or the police officer that there's pressure to change and then there's, there's the necessary support to make the change so if you want to teach it's no good berating teachers for not teaching mathematics better unless you show them through good training good materials and so on how they could teach mathematics mm. So it's always, it's a combination of pressure for change and support to make the change for everybody. Great. Let's turn to a specific country where you were part of designing a a really important initiative, which is the work that you did in the Punjab province of Pakistan, which I would remind the readers is a province of about 110 million people. So we're talking about a place almost double the size in population of South Africa. What was the initiative? What did you do? And what did you achieve there? Well, I can tell you what I did and I can tell you what the initiative was and the achievements are not mine. They're the achievements of the Chief Minister of Punjab and countless officials and teachers and doctors and uh, and nurses. But I I, I first went in 2009 and in the following 10 years, I visited Pakistan 54 times, I think. and we set up a delivery function, first of all, for the school system to get um, to make sure children were um, enrolled, teachers showed up every day and did their job, um, that there was good data eventually on the performance of children, whether it was getting better. So we, we built a system to uh, exactly as I've just described to you, actually, so that we had a, an education form with very clear priorities. We designed a delivery system in the Department for Education, but answerable to the chief minister, not just to the department. And then we, I went every two months to review progress in exactly the way we've just been talking about uh, with the chief minister. Uh, and then uh, three or four years in, when we were making progress on education, we applied the same thing to uh, health and particularly to vaccination of young children. This is before COVID. So the basic vaccination against basic childhood diseases. Uh, and we did the same again. And the, the, as a result of the efforts of teachers all over the province, uh, doctors and nurses all over the province, um, and some fantastic officials in the Punjab government, because these reforms became well known and good officials wanted to work on them because you could see the results coming through. Um, as a result of all that, we, we made really good progress. It was the fastest ever build up in the world of children's uh, of immunity against childhood diseases. Yeah. So it went from 55% vaccinated to 85 or 90% within two years. On education, enrollment uh, reached 93% every day. Uh, teacher attendance was over 90% every day when it had been below 80%. Uh, the buildings were all fixed. Uh, the water ran from the taps. The girls' toilets were re- reliable and sensible. Uh, and the uh, and from about three or four years in, the performance of the children began to improve, measured on two or three different indicators. And people started talking about it uh, and trying to replicate it in the other provinces. So it, it was fantastic. And if I attribute it, I, I, there's a whole range of Punjabi um, officials and public servants who are responsible. But the chief minister was absolutely decisive. He stuck with it at the beginning there were maybe four or five people in the province who thought this was sensible if he, and he was one of them. And I was a visitor who also thought it was sensible. But by the end, there were hundreds of, in fact, thousands of people seeing that this had actually made a difference. And he stuck with it, even when we went through implementation dips and things going wrong. 
So the leadership from the top was fantastic. Hmm. Hmm. But so tell us a bit more about the education reform in particular, a bit more detail about what yeah. needed to change and how you did that and involved, as I understand, involved outsiders to the education system as well. Yes, there were, well, there were, there were two, um, strand, two broad strands to the reform. One within the public system, which was to make sure the buildings were uh, safe and sensible and good in the way that I was describing with a boundary wall and toilets and mortar. Make sure the teachers actually turned up every day. When I when we started on this, roughly 78 or 79% of teachers showed up on any given day, so more than 20% didn't. Um, uh, and then lots of children weren't enrolled. So you have to get into the detail to fix those things. With getting children to school, we were teachers were going out from schools, knocking on doors and saying, your child could come to school. It, and, and the parent might say, well, nobody, the teachers don't turn up. And they say, well, we do now, you know, with that. So, so you, you really, it, child to child. And we worked out that if a teacher knocked on a door and had a, a child with her and the mm. latest new textbook, suddenly the parent could say, oh, this is different. And the child would say, yeah, come to school. And then the next following morning, you go along that street and you bring all the children together in a group. So it's so a very active recruitment and enrollment um, was, was important. Uh, at the beginning and, and really focusing on the basics just does the building work um, is the teacher there have, has, has she got a textbook uh, and are the children there that was the beginning but then we got into I, I, I'm not sure how much detail you want a, a six point cycle of what you have to do to improve the quality of teaching and learning you have to redefine the learning objectives you have to make sure the textbooks are rewritten where there's learning objectives in you have to train the teachers to use the textbook you have to check that the teachers are Using, using the, the, the textbooks and learning the new methods. You have to change the tests so they test what the, the, these new learning objectives and then you review all of that and plow that back into the teacher training. So that's a, it's a cycle. Um, and that's, that takes a while to put in place and it takes time. You have to persist with it. So going back to your question, you can make a different, a visible difference in two to three years, but to really shift the learning outcomes dramatically, that is a, a five to 10 year task. Hmm. So hmm. it, it, and at the beginning, most teachers were sceptical, I would say. Some were overtly critical. And by the end, I think most of them really appreciated it. And by the way, one of the, you know, I haven't mentioned some of the big changes. All the teachers were recruited on merit. That was a new thing that before the local MP had said, I want my friend so-and-so to... And that was a big... That the chief minister had to lead that, and he had to fight with his own MPs to say, look, we're, gonna, we're moving... This was our phrase all the time from the politics of patronage to the politics of performance. We have to appoint teachers on merit. We have to appoint district officials on merit. So that was the public system. And then in parallel, we set up a thing called the Punjab Education Fund, which funded um, low cost private schools to provide education for poor children. And the, the low cost private school could have the children funded as long as they agreed to test the children. Uh, and publish the results. And then we built a voucher scheme solely aimed at very poor parents whose children weren't in school. And the voucher could only be taken to a school, a private school that was registered and that would test the children and show that the children were making progress. And that proved to be very, very effective actually, because it, at the time of the reform began, and this is, this is unknown data often in many countries, there were about 55% of children were in government schools and about 45% were in low cost private schools. Oh. And the reason that had happened is because the parents had seen that many of the government schools were closed. The teacher wasn't there. And so they, they scraped together a, a small number of rupees to send their child to a low cost private school because they care about education. But then by, by having both strands at once, you generated a sense of competition. As the government system improved, parents would drift back to the government system and the private schools would have to get better. So, so there was an element of competition involved. And you can yeah. imagine that was very controversial. Tell us more about how the, the political head in the Punjab dealt with these, dealt with vested interests and how he managed to overcome them to get merit in the sort of appointments and all these other issues. What were the key characteristics of the, the, the political um, kind of leadership that you're talking about? Um, the key characteristic was passion um, and 
frustration and anger would come out. I used to say to him before or after meeting, really, you know, I'm not sure you, that's the best way. And he said, Michael, you don't understand Punjab. And what you did in Britain is different. I'm here. I'm, and every now and again, he banged the table. Um, I remember one very, very vivid um, meeting where the officials were saying it was all going wrong and they, he was unconvinced that they were really on the case. And he banged the table and he said, look, let's just try and remember some things. In 1947, when we became independent, Germany had been flattened in the Second World War. Japan had been flattened by the nuclear bombs. And now look at Japan, now look at Germany, and now look at us. Are you telling me that the people in Pakistan are less talented than the people in Germany and Japan? I don't think you are telling me that. So why aren't we able to match them? Now that's quite a tough message. Mm. Um, and then and then you go back to dealing with whatever the problem was. So he was very passionate and always evidently focused on wanting to improve the system. So the, the officials were sometimes dr felt driven and under pressure and felt his anger, but they recognized his integrity and his determination to solve these problems. Now that, but, so I thought he was impressive and he didn't get distracted when things went wrong. He didn't give up. Mm. He, he, he was a very, very impressive piece of leadership. Hmm. And I mean, surely the vested interests pushed back at him and politically he was threatened in some way. Yes, I mean, he won two terms during this. So, so he, he, he won in 2008, 2013, he lost in 2018. Um, and there, there, were, there, was, there was some pushback initially from teachers and, uh, and teacher unions, um, but they were, they were defending the indefensible. They were the, the, the 35,000 teachers who didn't turn up on any given day and now had to work. They didn't like it. They, you know, they were getting paid and not working. So of course they don't like it, but, but it's un indefensible in public. And so he took that on um, and he had very good, he appointed very good senior officials in his department who were people, uh, uh, some parts of the Punjab and Pakistan bureaucracies uh, are not, on, you know, corruption is not unknown, uh, ineffectiveness is not unknown. And he assembled around the reforms really, really good officials. Mm. Uh, the, 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 the compliment you pay somebody newly appointed in Punjab, if you, if you think they're good, is he's hardworking and honest. And um, it tells you something about all the others, but they, he built a group of hardworking and honest people who stuck with it. The, and then there were basic things like the officials moved all the time. They, they, they were, quite often you'd have four secretaries of education in a year. So I was saying to the chief minister, you, you'll never reform anything if that happens. So he, he appointed good people, hardworking and honest, who really worked hard and who stayed two, three, four years in the same position. Yeah. And that made an enormous difference. So these basic nuts and bolts make an enormous difference. Mm -hmm. and, and what's happened since he's left? Have the reforms continued? Is performance still going up or it's, it's been transitory? It's... It, it wasn't transitive because it was a kind of an eight or nine year program and, and, and some of it's been invented. The pandemic, obviously, as in other countries, had a, a, a pretty damaging effect uh, across the board. I would say um, that lots of it has survived, um, and, but, but it has been set back by the, the pandemic and the, the change of leadership. Um, and, but the, but they, they, they are still doing it. And I haven't personally been back, but they, they are still... Um, doing some of it in the health reforms where technology played, we, getting data in both health and education is important. So getting monthly data from every school, monthly data, or actually almost hourly data from every vaccination. So the vaccinators in the health system had a tablet. So they, so we could track them on GPS so that you could see in the, in the Department of Health in Lahore where everybody was. And when they, when they vaccinated a child, they photographed the child with the tablet. And the photograph went instantly to a computer in law. So in the, 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 the minister, the secretary for health could see literally where every single vaccination in Punjab had been that day. And after a while, you then deploy the vaccinators to where the gaps on the map are, um, which was powerful. So, so that, that, that the use of technology, which we'd also done in education for getting uh, test scores and uh, checking, counting the children and counting the, the teachers all made a huge difference. So those things stayed. But the yeah. pandemic has been a setback. Mm, enormous setback for education around the world, really. Yes, um, here in here in England, um, 
teacher, sorry, student attendance, pupil attendance at school is now below 90%. That, that, that's never happened in my lifetime. And the pandemic has had that consequence. And so we have a very good Secretary of State for Education, um, who is interestingly an immigrant from, um, uh, from um, Iraq, age five, uh, unable to speak English, now Secretary of State for Education in England. And he's really focused on fixing this attendance thing because he knows how important education mm. is. Mm. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Let me move back to the general. A few years ago, you wrote a book with a wonderful title, which is how to, how to run a government to, I can't read my writings, how to make a government so that citizens benefit and taxpayers don't go crazy. What are the key issues you deal with in, the gov in that book that, that you could share with us? Yeah, well, so some of them we've been talking about um, and, uh, and that, it, because it was an attempt to distill what I'd learned both in the British government and the Pakistan experience, which when I wrote that, but was still quite new. And in my later book, I've, I've written more about Pakistan, but, but I've wor worked now with governments in uh, 40 or 50 countries. Um, and you, you see a pattern to the, where either a minister or a whole government succeeds, there's a pattern. And the, the, when I tried to, when, when I wrote how to run a government, I was trying to describe that pattern in a way that if you're, um, if you're a leader in government, whether you're an official or, or an elected politician, here's a pattern that you can follow. So it's practical advice with some stories and, and encouragement to how to, get, how to get the job done in government. And it goes through what I've just been saying, set the priorities, build your organization to do it, um, drive it through, build routines. The crucial thing is building routines. So the reason I went every couple of months to Punjab is to keep the chief minister focused on every two months reviewing progress because government governments are, as you know you, you see it in your own country but we see it everywhere driven endlessly by crises and events and so most lots of politicians around the world spend their whole time just running from one crisis to the next and unless you build those routines in you can't get things done so there's a whole chapter on routines which is more exciting than it sounds solving problems how to allocate public money it's it's really it's it, i've written it for a general reader but it, it's it's helpful to um to a to a, to a politician. I mean, last just over a year ago, Boris Johnson called me and said, "Would I come and set up for him what I did for Tony Blair, which I then did?" And he said the reason the reason he called me is because he'd been reading How to Run a Government. And he said, "Look, I, I want to be able to do this. So can you can you set up for me?" So and um, Justin Trudeau has read some of it. I did four years work for him. Um, the, so people around the world have read that book, and it is it's written. Not, not from I'm, I wasn't a politician I was a, a, an advisor to, the, to a prime minister but it's written with a kind of sympathy and empathy for the challenge of getting things done in a political system where so much commentary on politics is critical and negative and cynical so that that's what makes me proud I think it is people who read it and are in government think, oh yeah I, I could see how I could do that I watched a talk you gave on the book where you started with this, some quotes from this wonderful cynical reforming politician or not reforming politician long before Putin in Russia and yes. um, yes. perhaps you could tell those stories yes, yes. Well, well there was a, there was a Russian prime minister in the 1990s so after the fall of the Soviet Union and before Putin there was a prime minister called Viktor Chernomyrdin who is the only as far as I know funny prime minister in Russian history um, <laughs> and um he said, he had a, there are a number of things that he said that are, uh, are funny and brilliant. One is, we keep inventing new organizations and they all turn out to be the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which, which is so, so true and so Russian. And then the other thing he said when he finished was, we tried to do better, but everything turned out as usual. Yeah. Um, and I wrote, I wrote How to Run a Government to say to people, it doesn't need to turn out as it does usually. You can actually deliver things that people will see, know, and feel, and appreciate. Um, so, yes. You had this, this wonderful sort of statement that many governments run by spasm rather than routine. Talk us, talk us through that a bit more, because I can see where you're going. That must be the natural inclination with so many pressures on you. As yes, a I, 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 in, I'm not sure if I, I, I have to stick with the phrase because I invented it in 2002. Um, 
I, I was doing, when I was working for Blair, I presented to the cabinet every six months or a year. Um, and I did this slide on, which I still use regularly, on government by spasm versus government by routine. And the government by spasm was my attempt rather harshly, but um, pretty honestly to describe what Blair's first term had been like. And the government by routine was what we, he and I were trying to put in place in the second term. And government by spasm is running after the latest crisis, massaging the data, making loads and loads of announcements, um, uh, pretending bad things aren't happening, uh, sort of panicking and rushing from one crisis to another. And most ministers and prime ministers will recognize that instantly. Government by routine is setting your priorities, collecting data, checking whether it's working, building routines to review progress, uh, solving problems as they arise, um, not making random, lots of random announcements, but periodically updating people on the progress you're making um, and making sure that when you do review progress with officials or ministers, if you're the prime minister, you have a proper honest conversation, not just a shouting match, not just a blame conversation. Um, my Russian friends, you were talking about my Russian friends, um, I've got lots of good friends in Russia who, by the way, are being very um, uh, unbelievably courageous right now. Um, but they, they, they taught me when I started learning Russian, they said, there are only two words you need, to, phrases you need in, in uh, Russian government. One is who's to blame and the other is what's to be done, which, uh, uh, as you may know, is a famous... Uh, yeah, exactly. But in fact, in Russian, um, who's to blame, which is Tovinovat, is... is um, that's not, and, and actually it's not just in Russia, but every government in the world, when something goes wrong, Kotovinovat is the first question, who's to blame? And then nobody will tell the truth anymore because they're all trying to mind their backs. And who's, who, what's to be done is a good question, except in English, we, we don't distinguish except by, a, by a body language. So we say, you can say what's to be done, or you can say, what can you do? These are, they're, they're, they're the same, same Russian words translated, but too often in Russia, it was, what can you do? Wow, wow. Now, I think that is a, a lot of officials give up hope that you yeah. can't reform things. Things are too difficult. The system's too big or whatever the reason, there yeah. is an issue of how you, you inject hope into a, yes. a reforming system. Yes, and you can start small you can take one thing and do it well. You can assemble effective people. You can look at the delivery chain on a particular thing to a particular city or a particular province. Uh, um, so you, you can start small, but we, you, you're right. And I can understand how officials get ground down and begin to begin, become cynical. Um, and I can understand how politicians who generally start very idealistic find it such a grind and such a burden. Um, under enormous pressure that they too become cynical but cynicism is never a good thing there's no problem skepticism is sometimes helpful but cynicism is, no, is corrosive and damaging so you have to find ways of first of all assembling the people who really want to get something done so to building it um it might start like like with the chief minister in Punjab with the relatively small people then you constantly build your coalition and doing that in a very conscious way so you go from half a dozen to 20 to 100 to thousands uh, and eventually you've got a, a movement for change and that needs systematic attention and then the set the second thing is to to get some early demonstrations of success they sometimes get called quick wins which is it's, it's a bit simplistic to me but it's, but early demonstrations of what success would look like and then if people say you'll never get it on you say well look I've, i can show you I'll, I'll take you to wherever it is and you can see it for yourself and that really helps so what is your advice to reformers about the media? Should you talk a lot about your reforms and the kind of boring routines? Or how do you deal with this? How do you communicate the success and the sort of what you're talking about so that people get more confidence in the politician and the bureaucrat? Yeah, it's, it's very, very difficult. And I'm not personally expert on it the, but I do write about it in uh, in as far as it relates to delivery in in the in the book that you mentioned and I think the the, the, cr the crucial thing is not to go around endlessly over promising and then you just you just can't get the job done and then people turn on you because you promised this and you didn't do it. you promised that you didn't do it so so going into it with some 
consciousness that this is a long game. It's not just about whether you get headlines tomorrow, because that headline will have consequences five years from now or next year or whenever. I, I don't know if um, your audience will like references from English literature, but um, or English and American literature, but I, I use a contrast in uh, my recent book between um, Charles Dickens's Great Expectations, where Pip uh, is introduced on page one in a terrifying scene in a graveyard where he meets Magwitch. I don't know if you remember, it's, it's famous in the film. It's right on page one. So on literally on page one, you're drawn straight into the story of these two characters who will be central to the whole thing. If you read Moby Dick, Captain Ahab, who is the main character, isn't even introduced till page 217. Oh. Um, you've heard, sort of heard rumours about him, but he doesn't actually appear so, so when you're doing it, when you're in, embarking on some new strategy, you can either, you've got your options between Pip and Ahab. You can announce it all at the beginning and then spell it out, or you can just go quietly into it and teach people a lot about whaling and all of that, and then bring your character in later on if they have the patience. I think sometimes when you're designing a government program, you think it's tempting to have a really big launch right at the beginning, but maybe it's better just to get on with the job relatively behind the scenes go quietly and then say look what we've done um so yeah. i think i think that you can think about that and then and then being careful about how you craft the messages and this is easy to say but um uh, and so important the message has to have integrity we are going to do this and we're doing it for these reasons and um if it works it will be like this and this is how we're going to do it so so t telling people what you're going to do why you're doing it what difference it'll make to the country and then how you're going to go about it and then updating people regularly rather than just thinking about tomorrow's announcement. Mm. Good advice. I like this. One of the things you said, which was uh, getting results is more likely to defeat opponents than making nice with them. Um, I'm wondering in what context you said that. It's very uh, apt, it seems I to me. I can't remember that. It's got, but, but basically the, the, best, the best thing governments can do it to, to um, win credibility with people, which is in the end how you beat political opponents, is to deliver and so that people see and feel the difference. And I, when I say deliver, I don't mean make a speech or write a white paper or pass a law. I mean actually change the facts on the ground. So my school works better or crime in my community has dropped or whatever it might be. Uh, and you don't necessarily have to overclaim about the results. You do have to talk about them. But, well, I had this debate with the Trudeau cabinet at the end of their first term, and they, they did well, and they won. They won re-election, and they were they were talking among themselves about we should claim this and that and the other, and they had done really well. But Trudeau said to them, "Well, the way we're going to present this is not we the Liberals have done X, Y, and Z. We're going to say over the last four years, Canadians have achieved this." Mm -mm. You know, we, the government, didn't create 500,000 jobs. Employers across Canada created 500 jobs. So we're going to give the credit to Canadians. And so you have to find a language to give the credit out and then uh, hope that some of it comes back to you. If you just claim all the time, people get a bit cynical. They're, oh, they're always claiming that, but my life's still just as bad as it was before. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to get, you've got to get the message right. By the way, um, on that, and in your neighbouring country, Mozambique, there was a great prime minister uh, in the early 2000s called Luisa Diogo. I don't know if you came across her, but she's a very impressive. Hey. And I talked to her about the, uh, and she's interviewed for my, for my next book, which, which we'll talk about later. Uh, where she had there was one year when Mozambique grew by 15%, GDP grew by 15%. That's pretty much unheard of. And the World Bank said, no, it is really true. It was when they were a few years out of the civil war. So I think it's beginning to take off. So I said to her, how did you do that? And she said, oh, I didn't do it at all, Michael. The people of Mozambique did it. The women of Mozambique did it. And then she said, the job of government is to, is to create the circumstances so that people start singing. So, you've got, and then, so she goes on, so you've got to unlock the music in people. I think that's a lovely image for what government should do. Fabulous image, yes. <laughs> Let me move and ask you a, a totally hypothetical question. What would your advice be to the president of a country 
which is in really deep trouble. Crises on every front, from employment to the economy, to security, to healthcare, to education, where you're wallowing at the bottom of all global tables. How do you choose priorities and where do you start? How would you advise a president in those circumstances? You do have to choose priorities. I mean, you have to try to manage all of that, of course. Um, but you have to choose priorities um, where you are going to show what the how the country could be changed for the better, and you're going to show people this is this is what we this government want to do, and and we're going to show you in health or reducing crime or whatever it might be, and really focus on that even while you manage all those crises. And that's going back to the, the beginning of this conversation. If you've got some kind of delivery function that is 100% focused on your priorities, then while you uh, are caught up in the swirl of crises around you, you know that this there's this absolutely steady focused part of your operation that you mm. trust that is getting on mm. with the job. My, my mm. absolutely favorite example of this in British history was in 1940. So, you, you, you'll remember that the, uh, the, the Nazis uh, conquered France in the spring of 1940. Uh, the Americans weren't yet in the war. The Soviet Union wasn't yet in the war. Britain was alone uh, the, in, over the skies of the south of England that uh, summer and early autumn. There, were, um, there was the Battle of Britain, uh, which was meant to be a preparation for a Nazi invasion, which because it lost the Battle of Britain, they couldn't do. And then they started bombing London every night for 40 nights through the autumn. So that's the context. In the, in the Department for Education, which was at that point called the Board of Education, they were evacuating children out of the big cities to, to safer places where they would be um, much better protected from the, the bombing, not just of London, but of other cities. But the, the permanent secretary of the Department of Education got a group of six officials, good officials, and he said to them, look, we, we can manage the evacuation without you. I want you, I booked you a hotel well out of London in a safe place. I want you to go there and spend the next three or four months designing the education system for after the war. This is in 1940, hmm. when there was a very good chance that Britain wouldn't ever come through the war uh, in one piece, but he still had the confidence to do that. And they wrote what became the first green paper in British history for for. for the future of education system and then in 1944 it became 1944 education act and later it was the primary school system that i grew up in now that that was a very very conscious moment to to say you six do this and a president of any country can do that at any moment say look we've got all these crises to deal with but you three or you ten you five just go and be there and design the system and design not just the what you're going to do but how you're going to do it and how we're going to get it done and or do what Blair did and say to me, I've, I've got a mandate to, you know, I've been an instruction from deliver from the British people and you're going to do it. You do the delivery, Michael. You make sure it gets done because I've got to deal with all this other stuff. And you can do that. Any president can do that at any time and get started and show what, what good could look like. Show mm. people in the government, out of the government, show yourself, build your confidence. Mm. Interesting. One of the things you mentioned to me when we met a few years ago was the, the nature of not just the delivery unit concept for a reforming president, but the relationship between at least the head of that unit and preferably a few others and the president, that, that they needed to be people who could, in a sense, talk back to the president and say, you know, why aren't you focusing on your priorities? What are you doing sort of racing around on some non-priority issue? Can you yes. talk a bit about that? Yes, you do. You do. So if you're going to get a delivery unit that works, you have to have a head of it who has a rela direct relationship with the political leader and can have a, a, an honest conversation with her or him. And that is absolutely fundamental. And the reason I kept, in the first few years, kept going to Punjab is because that is a very different political culture. So... The, uh, the officials were reluctant, afraid to tell the chief minister when things weren't working. And I, can, I could understand that. But I could, I could tell him because the worst that could happen for me is he'd say, stop coming to Pakistan every two months, uh, which, you know, I, I enjoyed it, but I had <laughs> things to do. So, so I was very direct with him and I've yeah. learned 
a manner of telling people difficult things in very calm, plain speaking language. And that is really, really important. And certainly I had those conversations with Blair in the first two years, I'd say most of the things we were working on weren't, the results weren't going in the right direction, but you keep doing, and you have to, if you're running a delivery function, say, look, the results aren't where we want them to be, but the underlying elements are coming into place. And so the results will come and you have to have a, there's, there's a leap of faith there, but you have to have the confidence that what you're doing or what the government departments are doing will actually work in time. Mm. Uh, and there are lead indicators that can tell you some of that. Mm. So the honest conversation is really important. And it's such a relief for a prime minister or president to have somebody who just tells them exactly how it is. To be honest, that you think it's going to be terrifying to tell them these things, but actually they're just relieved to have somebody who's just straightforward and plain speaking because most of their conversations they're thinking, does he really mean it? What's he actually mm. doing? All that. So they can take all that out. I had the advantage with Blair that I'd known him before he was prime minister. I worked with him on policy out before 1997. That helps. But with Shabazz Sharif in Punjab, I learned that on the job and we built a very uh, close relationship in the sense I've described. So yes, anybody can do it, but it does take courage at the beginning. But I assure you, most political leaders in the end, they really like having somebody who'll just tell them how it is. Mm. Mm. Michael, before we close, let's talk a bit about your new book called Accomplishment, uh, where I think you're applying some of these insights to sporting teams, to business, to all sorts of different fields. What's different about the book? What are the new insights? I loved your story about the World Cup and the English, um, the coach of the English side. Yes. So maybe Yes, well, I mean, the, the, what I saw in when I wrote, I wrote How to Run a Government because I'd seen this pattern of delivery in government. And then I, I read lots of history books and uh, follow sport. And I saw that great accomplishment, the same pattern occurred in uh, great scientific experiments. Like in, in my new book, Accomplishment, I tell the story of Galileo proving that Copernicus was right. It, it's a classic story of delivery. I tell the story of Picasso painting the famous picture Guernica. It's a classic story of delivery. All the elements that I've just been talking about with you are, are, are spelled out. And so I thought there must be, it must be a good thing to spell out the pattern of accomplishment, not just in government, but in, in, in general. And by the way, I applied the pattern to myself. So I wanted to, I wanted to break my personal best on a 10 mile time trial on my bicycle. And I did the cold deliverology thing and I got there. Um, so and I, I was helped in that because I was also at the same time working for Team Sky, the cycling team that, that, mm. uh, that have Chris Froome, who spent a lot of his youth in South Africa. Uh, at, at that time, he was their lead cyclist. And he um, and, and so I, I was telling them that I was trying to do this time trial myself faster than ever before. And they said, that's really exciting. And they said, maybe you could borrow one of our bikes to do it. So I, I did. I actually did my personal best on a Team Sky bike. So you could say that was cheating, but it was good fun. Um, anyway, the, the point is the pattern works. And here's the more serious point. And it, if you look at the challenges facing an individual country, whether it's Britain or South Africa, or facing humanity, all the outcomes of COP26 on climate change, the loss of biodiversity, uh, 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 never mind uh, war and peace and conflict resolution. In, in that context where there are many very, very serious threats to humanity, having a pattern of accomplishment that might work, that people could apply, whether they're running a school or a business or a government or a sports team, you'd think that must be something really good to have. And the pattern is spelled out in the book. The stories are told. I don't say it's easy because difficult things are difficult. This is difficult stuff, but there is a pattern. And if you follow the pattern, it will work. Hmm. And that's exciting. My last question then is, I understand you're doing something new with Pakistan, focusing specifically on from the politics of patronage to performance. Okay. What, is, what is this new thing? What yeah. are you trying to do? So for about a year or two, uh, for about a year or two, I've been working with, and when I say, you, you, you put the questions I'm trying, I'm helping yeah. a brilliant uh, woman called Sanya Nishta, who is the... Um, advisor on poverty or poverty reduction and alleviation to Imran Khan, the, the prime minister. She's a, a wonderful woman. Um, she, she, um, 
she's saint saint like so she's absolutely fantastic she's really committed she's designed a very comprehensive anti-poverty program and she and i have taken the phrase that i used to use in conversation with shawas tarif and applied it into the anti-poverty program this is about the politics of performance not about the politics of patronage she's taken out all the patronage out of the system she's eliminated uh chunks of corruption that had grown into the cash transfers uh she's um she's doing a phenomenal uh, job and we're, we're she, she's actually uh, there, there will we will be publishing something on this in the not too distant future but it i think she is bringing about the most ambitious and comprehensive anti-poverty program that's ever been attempted anywhere in the world and it's mm. really exciting mm. um so there, there, there's innovation there and because of the pandemic i haven't been able to go there but we but we talk regularly um and uh so my role is very modest it's more like being a, a critical friend or a challenge function uh but, but she's done it and it's fantastic and we, we've looked at anti-poverty programs my team has looked at poverty programs anti-poverty programs in the rest of the world to compare it to hers and we will i think we'll show that she's really built on what others have attempted before and taken mm. it to a level so again my question is that puzzles me is how does she deal with the politics of this? Because South Africa struggles with this. Is, is it yeah. the quality of the leadership that takes, takes risks and then sort of I think she, she not, can deliver? She takes risks. And I think that the thing about taking risks, everybody can go around saying be risk-taking. When you are prepared to take risks, you also have to face the possibility that you might fail or you might. That's it's, it's part of the definition of taking a risk, isn't it? And and she's and you have to like when I was going to Punjab, I wanted desperately wanted to succeed, and I became very committed to the whole thing. But I also understood all the way through that this might not work, and if it doesn't work, I'll have failed, and I'll have done what I can, and then so you have to. So so she is absolutely committed in a, in a both um, I'm going to say almost a spiritual sense as well as a, a political sense. She's actually not a party political person, although she's very loyal to the to the prime minister. But she's very committed to the program. But she 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 has to acknowledge that at times some things are not going to work and be ready for that. But the crucial thing in politics is she has got a prime minister who everybody knows because of cricket. But, but he's he's a he, he, he's very very supportive of her throughout that when yeah. she. She, she doesn't go to him and say and endlessly moan about things. So I'm doing this. I want to do that. Will you, I mean, he backs her. So that, and I remember that when I was working for Tony Blair, if you knew that your back was covered by your leader, you could, you could take on anything. And the worst that can happen is you'll, you'll end up an argument. But as long as you've got the, the political leadership behind you, and I think that is a key lesson in any circumstance. So if, if, in, if, if, if you're doing something somewhere in, South Africa in the federal level, you need to know that the president will support you if this ends up in controversy or conflict. My, mm. m m the, the worst examples of failed delivery are often where my, my, my friend who ran the school system in Louisiana, then, this is 10, 15 years ago, the then governor encouraged him to take on some radical reforms. And then when lots of people started complaining about them, the governor just sold him down the river. That's that that makes life very very difficult if you're mm. the official mm. well i think that's a great note on which to end the quality of leadership and loyalty uh to what you're trying to do yeah absolutely and, and if i can finish with so when i finished working for tony blair and he and i were talking about what we'd done what he'd done i said what do you think if you, when you look back what do you regret he said we should have been bolder so we were quite bold, but he, but you, you won't, you won't sit around. If you, if you're bold, if you attempted something and didn't, it didn't work. That's somehow better than just I just sat around dealing with today's crisis and the headlines, and then you get to the end of the term and think, what do we do? So I think, I think, being being willing to be bold and building an ever growing group of people around you to see it through is really important. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating hour. I think there's a lot of relevance for South Africans to think about. So 
This has really been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you found this as interesting as I did. And um, we'll see you next time. And Thank we you will very be much, writing Michael. this up. Thanks very much, Michael. It was Thank great. You. Pleasure to be with you.